see. So we're going to kick it off as usual. I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement, even though we are all virtual, many of us are on unceded indigenous land. So I think it's important for us to remember that we're here because of Sierra Nevada University MFA program, which is in Incline Village, Nevada on Washoe land. So acknowledging that the Washoe people have lived, thrived, um, and stewarded that land for long before the college was there and will continue to do so long after the college ceases to exist. And we pay our respects to elders, both past and present, and thank them um, for the care of that land. I'm gonna hand it off to Julia to give us some information about the program. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us again most of you for um, this lecture that we're having tonight, which is our, our final lecture for the winter um, 2021 MFA IA residency. And we're very lucky to have Cade Twist joining us as a, a visiting uh, professor and an artist in our midst. Um, and of course, our alum, illustrious recent MFA grad, Alejandra Rubio is gonna introduce Cade in more detail. But um, in the meantime, I just wanna say thanks for coming to the lecture. And I believe this is our last public event, right Anza? For this residency, but that doesn't mean that there won't be more public events associated with the MFA program and with our gallery programming during the spring semester. So stay tuned um, and get on our mailing list and we'll let you know what's, what's cool. So um, without further ado, I will introduce Alex. Hi hey everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce Mr. Kate, Kate Twist. So Kate Twist, he lives where the land meets the sky, where the eagles and the raven fly free. He lives under the sun and the moon. He is, he's also a Native American inter interdisciplinary artist working with installation, environments, video, sound, and social practice. He is a member of the Cherokee Nation tribe. For 20 years, he worked with tribal policy and economic de development. Um, he, uh, now he works with tribal stories, with geopolitical nar narratives to examine the unsolved tensions between the market-driven system and American Indian culture self-determination. He is also a co-founder of Post Commodity, a Southwest Native American artist collective uh, he also works with um, Stephen Yazzie. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Twist has exhibited, exhibited national and internationally, including the 18th Biennial in Sydney, Scottsdale Museum of Contem Contemporary Art, the Whitney Biennial, his historic land installation with post-commodity repellent fence at the Southwest Mexi Mexico border of Douglas and Aguapierta, Sonora. Um, he published a book of poems called Marginal Equality, and uh, recently the LA Times did a review of his book. Um, he also felt that there were not enough Native American teachers, so he decided to become a teacher. So now he, for the last four years, he's been a professor at the Otis in LA, and he teaches MFA art and social practicing. Thank you so much, Alex. I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And um, at this time, I'm going to mute my screen. And um, I'm going to um, refer us to a text. And um, I think uh, everyone's going to find this really enjoyable. Um, this text is something that is near and dear to my heart. It's a way of sharing a, a strategy and a process and a way of sensing the world. Um, so um, I hope it, uh, I hope you, you find it uh, to be equally pleasurable um, 
let me see here where it is. Um, okay. And this is um, from the book of, of Ephesians, the New International Version. Um, and it is uh, chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Thank you for uh, allowing me to share that with you. Um, now, I'd like to open with a prayer, and then I'll uh, get to the business of the uh, ex uh, of this talk. Um, so um, here goes a prayer. Um, let us pray together for soil properties, climate, rainfall pollutants, and nutrient management drainage system design. Let us pray for the multiplicity of complex interactions, determining quantity and quality, unfolding right before your hands, eyes, and mouth, mimicking with engineers the functions of wetlands and prairie grasses with strategically placed management practices in the landscape. Let us pray as witnesses of eminence, of domains trickling down into a great sea that dries up and blows away as fine dust inhaled by public lungs as unresolvable dream, leverageable over time as appreciable value. Let us pray for the UNESCO sites we share between us. Let us pray for the water we share between us. Amen. All right. Um, thank you for joining me in this prayer. Um, uh, you can go ahead and unmute, unmute your screens for now, if you'd like, or whatever. I'm going to unmute mine, so you might be able to see me. Uh, now, I'd like to thank the Sierra Nevada University community, the students, um, particularly Alex, who I've gotten to know uh, during my time here, as well as the university's board and uh, Julia, Russell, Logan, Anza, and Gabby, who got me here, um, as well as all the participating faculty and staff and, and visiting artists. You know, for me personally, I don't think I'll ever forget uh, Walter's presentation. That was my introduction to his work, and it was so damn badass. Uh, it was heavy. So I really appreciate uh, getting exposed to new work and to new voices and brains and hearts and fire like that. It really is a genius. Um, I'd like to thank you all. Um, it's been an honor to be with you um, both in, in this moment and over the last two weeks. Um, and uh, with that said, um, I'm going to start with a um, poem and um, get into uh, some work. Um, I'm, my name, I've been introduced, I'm Cade Twist. Uh, in uh, Cherokee, raised in Bakersfield, um, currently living in a van uh, by the Bologna, Bologna Creek 
uh, in Culver City um, uh, behind the MFA building uh, for Otis. Um, so if you ever want to find me, I'm somewhere down there or I'm in Bakersfield uh, on the east side for life uh, or I am over in the coast in Morro Bay uh, surfing. Um, but it, it is great to be here. There's a, so I'm going to read a, a poem. Um, and, you know, like any poem, it's too long and it's unnecessarily complicated and likely uh, unread by 99.99999% of humanity. So in some respects, this might be an act of total futility, but I really do want to share it with you because it just got reviewed two years after it was published in almost two and a half years after it was published in the LA Times by Carolina Miranda. And I was so excited that she was the one to review it. Um, this, is from, this is a selection from the poem, uh, Marginal Equity. And um, it's a book length poem, uh, roughly a hundred pages and uh, 102 pages. And uh, it's a dialogue or a trialogue among three generations of Cherokees uh, living in Bakersfield. And just a little background, um, Bakersfield is, uh, you know, aside from being commonly referred to as the armpit of California, I'd like to think of it as the Paris of the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, so this is a love song, you might say, to place, to people, and to all the Cherokee people who died away from home. Um, and this is uh, the, the excerpt that I'm reading is the Project Abstract. And um, the book is written in the form of a, of a uh, grant proposal. Um, it's a hybrid from a um, USDA um, Rural Utility Services grant uh, application and a Ford Foundation um, grant application both of which um, I stumbled across through my work um, between the late 90s and just a few years ago. Uh, this really dominated my life from a non-artist perspective, more from someone working on the, in the field of public policy and, and uh, economic development um, with, uh, uh, with tribes and um, uh, national Indian organizations. So this is a project abstract and uh, it's just a few pages long, but I just wanted to share this with you because it is an important part of my art practice writing. That is, I started out as a writer before I was a visual artist and I still write and I'm um, working on another book. Uh, but um, all of my art starts with writing um, and I'd like to think that the act of writing for as many years as I've been doing it, um, you know, basically since 88, uh, it has um, helped me understand metaphor and how to position metaphor, I think, um, very astutely and strategically. Um, so I, I really think the success of my art practice, which is largely dependent upon the positioning of metaphor, <clears throat> Um, I, is, is, a, is a skill I learned um, through, uh, through writing. <clears throat> okay, project abstract, take one. The way words become genetic memory. Hunter beneath buzzard. Three words that exist in every shadow I have ever cast and every patch of shade I've desired. Alternate take. The significance of perspective is overshadowed by measurable impacts. It's easy to live with promises if you believe they are only ideas. That'd be my recommendation. But our dreams are another thing 
For instance, look at the land beneath your feet. Alternate take, the literal translation of metaphor. I went looking for work and never made it back home. One day I woke up to golden light, the crashing waves of the Pacific Ocean and a naked white woman with a big thick bush who wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. Alternate take, the nature of circular time and various things. The future and present are connected by a series of hangovers and a series of misappropriated opportunities we reach for things and pray they will bring hope. Alternate take, a credo for rationalizing the distance between land and flesh. <clears throat> there is no end. The way the sun rises over rivers is no different than the way the sun sets over oceans. There's only earth without mediation, one horizon or another. There's only trust and responsibility, loss and remembrance. Alternate take, structural problems that lead to various forms of abuse. <clears throat> it all goes back to the land, doesn't it? At some point, we'll call you, call your name and remind you what has happened? Alternate take. A Cherokee elder whispers to his grandchildren during the final barbecue he will ever host. You see the palm tree over there by the pool. It harbors rats, just like the cinder block walls that surround our dreams. I never planted the tree or built those walls but I paid for them. We all paid for them. Thank you. That's a, a, a selection from a very unnecessary long poem called Marginal Equity. Um, you're welcome to go out there and chase it down and buy it uh, online. Uh, so what I wanna start off with with this talk, now that I'm getting into post-commodities work, um, I am um, one of the founders of post-commodity, which is um, an indigenous interdisciplinary arts collective. And it's comprised of Cristobal Martinez and myself. Um, our art functions as a shared indigenous lens and voice to engage the assaultive manifestations of the global market and its supporting institutions, public perceptions, beliefs, and individual actions that comprise the ever expanding multinational, multiracial, and multi ethnic colonizing force that is defining the 21st century through ever increasing velocities and complex forms of violence. Post-commodity works to forge new metaphors capable of rationalizing our shared experiences within this increasingly challenging contemporary environment. Promote a constructive discourse that challenges the social, political, and economic processes that are destabilizing communities and geographies, and to connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination the broader public sphere. And it's at this point, it's important to note that um, I'm speaking about post commodities work because it's my primary art practice. Um, I think in 2008, I really stopped making solo visual artwork. Um, I've made work and I've shown work, but um, I had a last solo show 2016, but um, it's not something that I really do. Um, 
okay, only on rare occasions. Most of my time has been committed to, to post-commodity. And it's hard to talk about post-commodities work as, a, as, as just one person, because many of us have, have been involved with post-commodity. Raven Chacon has been in post-commodity from 2009 to 2018. Stephen Yazzi, one of the co-founders of Post Commodity from 2007 to 2010. Nathan Young, one of the co-founders of Post Commodity from 2007 to 2015. And then we've worked with additional collaborators, uh, a computer scientist and, and mathematician um, named Adam Ingram Goebel, uh, another mathematician and um, computer science engineer, Andrew McCord. Um, he worked with us on if history moves at the speed of its weapons and the shape of the arrow is changing. And in the, with the piece promoting a more just, verdant and harmonious res resolution. As well as Annabelle, Annabelle Wong, who uh, was our cinematographer for Dead River and Existence AD, was a band we collaborated with, the all Indian heavy metal band we collaborated for Dead River. Um, and that was uh, back in 2008. Um, hey Cade, I'm gonna jump in. I'm not sure if you realize we are not seeing a screen share. We had talked. I'm not trying to share the screen okay. yet. I was making sure that we weren't missing that. Yeah, I'm just sure. black now and I'm gonna go into it. Um, Perfect. Right now, yeah. Uh, so the first piece I wanted to talk about, and this is getting into screen share mode now. Um, desktop share, you're gonna see some of the chaos in my life. Um, you know, I wanted to do this presentation, you know, share some poetry and, and have a little fun at the beginning with a, with a prayer and so forth. Um, uh, but I think now um, I'll, I'll get into, it'll take a little bit more of a focused turn. Um, this is Let Us Pray for the Water Between Us. It's a site-specific in installation responding to the forced displacement of indigenous communities and the complexity of human relationships bound by shared sources of water that are increasingly difficult to protect and to preserve uh, from waste and contamination. Uh, for this work, Post Commodity transformed a 2200 gallon chemical storage tank, primarily used for industrial farming, into a self-playing percussive and res, uh, resonant instrument, which is a drum. Collective modifies a venerated place designed to secure cultural objects representing the Judeo-Christian Western scientific worldview by removing the resident Greek sculpture, uh, uh, door of forests or whatever the hell it's called and additional artifacts. I'm sorry for butchering that word, but that's the sculpture of the ideal man. Um, my altering, by altering the purpose of the rotunda, Post Commodity has prepared a new contemporary context suited to its indigenous voice. Shifted the rotunda, presents a symbolic upending of uh, the white European foundations in the museum and seeks to forcibly dismantle the institutional structures that have excluded or objectified um, indigenous peoples and their cultures. Um, this work uh, acknowledges and honors through living, breathing, sound, the role of indigenous tribes as important stewards of water, air, and land in Minnesota and throughout the Americas. It's a prayer for greater respect, accountability, transparency among state, federal governments, corporations, to tribal governments, and communities around appropriate management of our shared natural resources. Um, what you see here is the storage tank um, being suspended in the, the rotunda. Um, and we have removed the statues, the, the Greek statues from this place. And the statues were 
actually they informed the architectural structure of the rotunda. The rotunda was specifically designed for these statues and the statues never been removed um, as, a, as part of an institutional critique or a, a dialogue with, with the museum. Um, but we felt that they were problematic um, because there was an exhibition on display that was looking at the displacement of about 65 million people, which is our current reality and it has been for almost 10 years. Um, we live in a world of refugees, um, many of which um, are refugees to the war, um, political um, chaos, instability, um, financial collapse, unsustainable financial systems, farming practices, and so on. Um, and um, also the articulation of the global market and their respective communities. And so this big exhibition was going on at the time. And we just thought there is a problem in the space because you know, there's this historic feedback loop that exists in, in, in the world. And it's the world view which has driven scarcities throughout planet Earth. This world view is uh, a Judeo-Christian Western scientific worldview. Um, this world, world view evolved into um, what we now know as capitalism, as neoliberalism, as uh, globalism, it's free trade. Um, see, the world view is causing the scarcities, yet the same world view is being relied upon to create the solutions to these scarcities. And what you have is actually another industry that is built out. Um, and you have a process in which a market determined uh, solution emerges to resolve the scarcities of the past and in a sense then creates a new set of scarcities, a new set of dilemmas, a new set of complexities. And that's been the nature of this feedback loop that we've all you know been a part of, our relatives have all been a part of. Um, some of us um, have suffer genocide as a part of this process. Um, but we figured since there is this monumental exhibition honoring the narratives of these people and the intentions of the artists who um, are addressing these very pressing international issues and you know, many of which the works were critiques of capitalism uh, and neoliberalism um, and abuses of, of governance um, and power, we, we, we just thought it would help everyone to create a more peaceful and thoughtful environment by showing these statues the, the exit for a short period of time. We're not trying to, this isn't cancel culture. This is merely an institutional critique to foster a dialogue, to, to create a cause and effect relationship where the sort of analysis that we provide um, can be shared. And we chose this drum. Um, this drum is um, used uh, to store hazmat uh, chemicals, um, oftentimes uh, very strong um, bases and acids um, used in fertilizers um, that are mixed uh, at farms. And in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, um, tanks of this size are unregulated by the government. So you can have in tanks, um, you know, hydrochloric acid um, in multiple tanks, as long as they don't exceed that 2,500 gallon, uh, you know, limitation. Um, so it, and you're talking about a, a landscape of water, the most water rich, you know, land in the United States, and also the headwaters of the Mississippi. And, you know, there's, you're talking about a landscape where the aquifers are so shallow, you can dig a hole like five feet and strike water. So um, it's 
you know, a pressing issue that is a public policy concern. It's a public interest concern. And it is without a doubt an indigenous concern. And we thought at the time, um, we wanted to use this as a metaphor to think about something a little bit more deeply um, when we were thinking about um, these 65 million, you know, refugees, you know, on their hoofing it out there, um, struggling to, you know, find a place to rest and to scratch out a life. Um, we thought it would be nice to honor them with a song and honor them with the accountability that comes with the song. And the song is a very somber, quiet, um, meditative, and very peaceful song. And um, it's operated, uh, it's, it's drummed out by a brushless, um, programmable uh, motor and um, with a uh, mallet attached to the end of it, uh, comprised of leather. And it bangs out a song uh, that goes from four seconds to eight seconds. And, um, and it, every beat, it, in, it, the duration um, grows by uh, 10 milliseconds. So you have this shifting rhythm, this shifting duration, this, you know, sonic sub bass voice that is in continual motion, leading people one way, leading people another, returning circular, cyclical, also um, um, breaking and disrupting um, this feedback loop um, within this institution, um, within the conceptual framework of water management. Um, uh, within Minnesota and as a metaphor for, you know, the larger um, United States and North America. Uh, that's that piece. Um, that's my favorite picture. It really is just a beautiful, so my, it's the best instrument we've ever built. You know, we, Post Commodity builds a lot of instruments. We build a lot of systems. And they all function, like all the pieces function, they work, they play, and they do stuff. And um, I think this was one of the like most beautiful interventions that I've ever been a part of. Very, very proud of, of that piece. It'll be, it's shipping up north to Canada to, to be shown at the, uh, the Ramey Modern in Saskatoon. And um, we have a, a 12,000 square foot museum show there. And this is one of the pieces in there. And what we did was we gathered all of our commissions that, um, for 2019 and 2020, and um, we're gonna be exhibiting them together um, in this exhibition with some work that was commissioned for 2021. So it's essentially you know, a selection of work for the last uh, you know, two, three years. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, this is uh, an exhibition we did at LAX Art. It's a, one of the oldest, most prestigious uh, artist run spaces um, in uh, Los Angeles. Hamza Walker is the director of the space and chief curator. And um, before Hamza Walker came to LAX Art, he was. Uh, working at the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago, which shares the same building with the Logan Center. Um, uh, really, uh, really neat venues. Hamza is one of the great curators in the United States, uh, incredible human being. Um, here's some slides of, of the work just to give you a sense of what you're looking at. My collaborator, Chris Sobal, who's Chicano, you know, this really, uh, he was obsessed with this. So he put a bunch of pictures up uh, just to make them happy. So if you go to our website, there's more of these photos up than anything. Um, yeah. 
So, um, you know, since their inception, uh, lowriders have been indigenous American mobile sovereign spaces that broadcast visual and sonic knowledge. At LAX, our post commodity uh, calls upon this history to create its newly commissioned work titled Some Reach While Others Clap. For this work, the collective will focus on the support beams of the gallery, the structural bones of the building, as a metaphor acknowledging indigenous Americans as the historical and current foundation of Los Angeles, California. Post Commodity will collaborate, or we collaborated with Starlight Rod and Custom and its network of lowrider builders, painters, pragmatists, and visionaries to transform the gallery and its structural eye beams into an indigenous American space where its sovereignty of context is rendered for a constellation of codices that convey migrating stories about tribal affiliations, history, cultural self-determination, and prophecy. At the end of the exhibition, the name of the work changed to In Relation, at which point the beams will, were ceremoniously covered with the sculptures arranged on the gallery floor. Every year thereafter, at the winter solstice, the beams are uncovered and indigenous people in Los Angeles and Chicano people in Los Angeles and black people in Los Angeles and Asian people in Los Angeles and white people in Los Angeles gather at the gallery um, for dialogue. And um, it's an ongoing project. It's part social practice, part institutional um, critique. Um, love the light on this. Using lowrider iconography, um, pinstriping, um, we have these steel beams vertically, um, male and, and male and female, embodying the male and female spirit, which is what we do as Indian people. Uh, when we do ceremony, we think about the whole of us as a humanity and the roles we play and our relationship to those roles, the responsibility of those roles and the accountability of those roles. Um, so we have this sort of spirit here. And one of our goals was um, we were thinking of these lowrider builders as medicine men because they hack systems and they've hacked a technology, the automobile, which is built for speed and turned it into something that's built for slowing down the velocity of the world. So um, we imagine them as, as medicine people and their medicine is paint. So we wanted them, we wanted to get that medicine into the gallery. That was our only goal. And this medicine took this form, took this shape. Um, and these covers just laid on the ground. That was it. We stripped the paint off the other beams and revealed the the um, you know the where the steel was cast and produced, um, the original markings on the on the I beams, and this art space um, used to be an RCA recording studio, and um, I mean it was a sound stage as well for many Hollywood films. But, um, you know, you had some pretty famous stuff get recorded there, like pet sounds from the pet, uh, from uh, the uh, pet sounds from, I was gonna say pet shop boys, but <laughs> from, from the beach boys, um, you, you had jailhouse rock recorded there uh, by um, uh, Elvis, um, Intervisions was recorded there. Um, uh, just all kinds of really neat uh, recordings. Uh, the history of the place is really interesting. Um, and it, it's located in, in, in Hollywood, West Hollywood. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a strange and beautiful part of LA. And um, we we're just really blessed to be there. But what we did, what we created by doing this was bringing an indigenous virus into one of the hallmarks of the um, 
art world in LA. Um, after these were painted, Holmes is like, we, you can't strip that. We, you got to leave it. Like we need this here. And um, uh, so we formed a relationship through that, you know, of permanently altering this where we, um, where the, you know, the Hamza and, and, and the gallery, um, LAX art have transitioned into being stewards of the piece for a very long duration. So we have an agreement that as long as they are occupying that space, they will invest um, resources into preserving and maintaining the integrity of the work and supporting the programming of every winter at the winter solstice um, gathering and reflecting on the year and sharing stories and allowing indigenous people to share our protocols and processes and world views as a filter for these um, gatherings as a way of sharing our knowledge and the ways in which tribal leaders in the LA area, the, the Tongva people, um, a lot of people go to LA and have no idea that there's a tribe there, but the Tongva tribe, the Tongva people are, are from there. And so we're working with Tongva elders um, to manage um, the ceremonial components of this, but essentially we transformed this gallery space into, um, into a ceremonial space. And, held the institution accountable to preserving and protecting it and funding the gatherings moving forward. This was a huge experience for us, you know, because it's risky when you have a show at a venerated place and you don't use the walls at all. Like we didn't touch the walls, we ignored them that venerated colonizer space, we just left alone. And um, we dealt with the structure and substructure. And we dealt with reimagining the future through shared resources, shared commitments, and through relationships. So one of the important things that Post Commodity does in our projects is we try to apply a, a critical indigenous research methodologies to our work, which is thinking of, um, you know, there's a whole network of, of indigenous scholars that have worked on this um, methodology and, you know, for years and years and years and years. And um, it has, you know, it, it has emerged and um, Brian uh, Brayboy is, um, Professor Brayboy is one of the uh, lead um, academics in this movement, um, but there are many others. Um, you could say easily that LaDonna Harris is, is, is one of the drivers of that movement, but it's a, it's a research methodology that indigenous scholarships developed to, um, to enhance and you know, the, the ethical and moral issues of community-based research and to try to prevent the commodification of culture, of people, of data, of DNA um, uh, through research processes and to ensure that the findings of research benefit the community in which it takes place and that the findings are redistributed equitably throughout the community. Um, so the, the, met the methodology has been broken down into four R's. The, the first thinking about relationships. Our world is a relationship. Everything is interconnected. There's no way out of our relationships. The degrees of separation are the only things that change, but we are interconnected whether we want to admit it or not. It's just how things are. The best way that we can think of as, ind as indigenous people of honoring relationships is through respect. You know, respect is what drives and feeds those relationships. Um, and then we think about relevancy, um, that the research that we do, the work we do, when we engage communities, it has to be um, relevant. It has to be building upon their interests, meeting their needs, 
working to advance their social goals, their political goals, their economic goals, working in service of the public interest of the community. And lastly, um, the fourth R is um, reciprocity or redistribution. And that's creating reciprocal, building reciprocity into our relationships. You know, um, building modes of, and mechanisms for redistributing power um, through community um, that we benefit from in our research and our engagements. So this is an embodiment of that uh, process. And, and this work was shown and it actually was closed by the, um, by the pandemic. So it's still sitting like this. We haven't got a chance to close it up and we'll try to close it up in March and um, have a very small ceremony with some Tongva elders and some of the community members, members that are already in collaboration around this. Um, so that's some reach while others clap. And what I'd like to do is talk about um, one more. And I was gonna talk about with each incentive, which um, uses the Castillo uh, of Mexico and Central America. Um, it's also, um, these structures are also used in the Middle East and in Greece and things like that. So um, other developing countries, um, but the Castillos are ways of hacking systems. Um, they're ways of building for the future. You know, these are on top of buildings, concrete buildings, and it's, they're unfinished, but they're aspirational in the sense that they are the substructure for the next generation. The aspiration is that our grandparents will move, our grandchildren will move into our place and they will live there and we will finish this construction. And, but also it, it, it's, it's hacking in a way because, um, and at least in Mexico, it, you know, if you have this on your roof, these castillos, these, um, be, these um, you know, columns with the rebar, um, it's unfinished. It, 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 it renders your, your dwelling as an unfinished dwelling and that saves you significant taxation on your property. You, you don't have to pay the property taxes uh, because the building's not finished um, at the same rate you would as a finished building. Um, this was shown at the um, Art Institute of Chicago and this was also um, closed uh, by the uh, COVID. We had our two shows that we were really proud of that were interrupted by the, the pandemic. Um, and the idea here is for placemaking, um, where, you know, Chicago has experienced one of the largest migrations of human beings from south to north. Now this is uh, in a number of waves, you know, uh, one of those waves was, uh, uh, was a wave of black people, recently freed slaves, um, and also, um, you know, emancipated and uh, people that were part of that first big um, transition from uh, south to north. And as a result, Chicago has become one of the most uh, important cultural centers of black culture. And Chicago has built a home for black people and, um, you know, black arts, free jazz, you know, theater, you know, music, theater, film, art. They're, they, there's such a strong black organizational infrastructure in the city. Um, our idea was that, well, now we're having a second huge wave of migration of Mexican people and Central American people. Um, primarily Mexican people. Now there are over a million Mexican people living in the metropolitan area of Chicago. Um, Mexican people are now um, 
a larger majority than black people are in the society. And for us, this was a gesture of placemaking. It was a way of thinking about the institution of the building of the this venerated museum as uh, and their terrace, which is a terrace used for weddings and parties of the most affluent people in Chicago, because this terrace is lined with the famous, you know, Chicago skyline and architectural treasures uh, that, that Chicago is known for. So we, we have this terrace that we transformed into a system of castillos with the proposition being that there, we're building, we're making space. There will be a new generation of people arriving. This institution will build for them, will include them, will make them feel welcome. You know, And uh, one of the joys of working with this piece, one of the true joys is um, it, we maxed out the, the load capacity of the terrace. We wanted to create a heavy work, you know, to joke about it, you know, cause we're all into metal and stuff. Um, but we also wanted to create a heavy work, like a burden, like a pressing issue, something that is unforgettable, something that where everybody can share the weight and witness the weight together. And um, so we were, we totally maxed out the maximum load capacity of this place. And it was our sheer pleasure and joy to do so. Um, and it was a really exciting work to do. Um, I guess I'll go back to one last one real quick. Do you remember when? This was from 2009, and this is really the birth of our institutional critique. Um, uh, this was at the Arizona State University Art Museum. The, uh, the university, the museum, all of its buildings were built on, you know, Hohokam uh, land, um, burial grounds. There's the, uh, What's interesting is there's all this talk in Phoenix and, you know, Scottsdale and Tempe and, you know, this desert where over 5 million people live and there's no wa local water source, everything's piped in. Uh, and there's just all this talk about sustainability, sustainability this, sustainability that. How is a desert city with 5 million with no local water sources sustainable. You know, it goes back to the first piece I was talking about with that feedback loop of the Geo-Christian Western scientific worldview. Um, we wanted to interrupt that and remind people about the earth beneath their feet. And there's land to be accountable for. And there's stories and culture attached to that land. And that land speaks to us today, just as it did yesterday. This is a will tomorrow. And um, we just wanted to open that earth up and let it speak and um, document it and then let people interact with the space. So this is like a closed circuit sound piece. We have the slab. We have a contact mic in the piece where we get the resonant frequency um, of this piece in relationship to the room. We have a recording of a social dance song by Peeposh people. Peeposh people are part of the um, Gila River uh, Indian community and also the Salt River Pima Indian communities. And they're an important part of the river people who are in this valley um, in uh, central Arizona. So we traded and some songs and we got permission to sing a song of theirs with um, a, a song leader. We recorded that, we placed a wireless uh, speaker underneath the earth, covered it a little bit with the dirt, had that microphone going into the mixer. The mixer is going, is also bringing the, the, the resonant frequency of the space and, and, and that block of concrete and um, 
we have one delay pedal to help with the feedback, just to slow it down and to keep it under control. Um, and uh, we spatialize the sound through the rafters in a series of guitar amps that were strapped to the rafters. And um, it was this beautiful sound that it, it was great. You know, you had this tribal music, you had this hum, had this thing happening and you, but you also had a live microphone. So it also brought viewers into the sound, into the experience. And viewers could disrupt this feedback loop with their own actions. They could experience with the, themselves participating in the disruption of this feedback loop. Um, very, very proud of this piece. And um, it started a whole fun ride that has led me here to be here with you uh, this evening. Um, it's a uh, pleasure, absolutely, um, to be here with you. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for having me here and would love to answer any questions or, or talk or um, what have you. If anyone has questions, it's great if you type questions in the chat box and then I can call on you so you can unmute and ask yourself. Carrie, you're up. Hi, Cade. Um, hey. Thank you for your talk. Well, thank you. And um, I just wanted to ask you, um, seeing the post-commodity work on Art 21, because um, I had seen the project in Chicago and then the balloons along the border. And I was curious if you found that um, you've, you've gotten a wider audience maybe, or have you gotten a lot of um, more interest after you know, being on Art 21, because um, I instantly recognized the balloons during the slide slam and was like, oh, yes, that's so awesome, and was excited to learn more about your work and your and the group's work. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the Art 21 just came out, it's COVID era, and, you know, there's not a lot of, it came out during the shutdown, you know, so it's been, it hasn't amplified the practice as much as you might think, but it's it's really great to share our practice like that and to be canonized, you know, in the way that Art 21 canonizes artists. And it's a great teaching resource, you know, for um, high schools and undergrads and even grads. Um, and it's nice to have an Indigenous voice to be a part of that. You know, I thought their interviews that they did were great and, and everything is pretty fun. Um, but given the nature of how the whole art world is pretty much shut down, um, I, I, we still don't know the impact because there isn't a place where we can exhibit work yet or do an art talk in person or, or things like that. But um, yeah, uh, there's that. And there's also the documentary Through the Repellent Fence, which was on PBS. And I think that had more of an impact um, on our careers um, uh, for a lot of reasons. You know, one is just um, a longer form. It's in direct dialogue with one wow. work that was historic and, you know, in a very contentious location and all the stuff that was around it. It was exciting. And it was also juxtaposed and positioned with a canon of land art, which was, you know, also broaden that audience, you know, quite a bit and, and stuff like that. But, you know, every opportunity, you just hope you do the best you can and, and just hope that it is gonna, you know, like you're not gonna shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> you know, which is easy. It's a high, it's a high stress, high stakes, you know, profession, this art stuff. And, emotions run high and 
you know, we all feel, we all feel inadequate and stupid and, you know, insecure um, as humans. And, you know, it seems like exhibiting work can bring out the, bring that out. But so we're really happy we didn't shoot ourselves in the foot. I think that's more that we're happy about with Art 21 is we, like, it, okay, we didn't totally mess that up, you know, that type thing. And it was really good to expose people to some work. Um, we were hoping to expose more people to the work at LAX Art because it was such a sensitive and personal poetic piece and so minimal and uh, true to who we are as humans. Um, but it didn't really make it in there too much, you know? Um, they just ended up reusing a lot of the Repellent Fence movie, you know, and, and that sort of surprised me, but God, what an honor, what a privilege and how exciting, you know, I still haven't even, like even come close to rationalizing it. Allison, do you wanna ask your question? Thank you, Kate. I really appreciated your work. Um, and I appreciate you leading us in the beginning on a more meditative um, way to enter this conversation. Um, my question is a little bit more about your history as an artist. I'm curious if you've always been installation and mixed media or if how you found that um, it seems like the things you're interested in maybe the best way to articulate the messages that you're interested in is through installation mixed media but I am curious about how you ended up as an installation mixed media artist. Thank you that's a really good uh, question. Um, uh, I started with video to be you know, totally honest, uh, be, uh, video and text and sound. Um, and then video, text and sound started including sculpture and um, other materials and things like that. But the very first art, I one, I don't paint, I don't draw, um, I only have a sculpture practice, uh, expanded field sculpture practice really, you know, and um, I, I do take, do photography, you know, in a relationship with video, but I'm not a photographer. Um, but uh, I would say that I was drawn to, to the way text can uh, work in a space because I was a writer uh, because I studied with Edgar Hippoberts, who's, um, you know, one of my art heroes and most important mentors. Um, stayed with him at the University of Oklahoma. I was taking, uh, you know, policy and economic development classes, but I was also, I got to take a, a couple art classes. And one was um, a class with, with him looking at contemporary issues. Um, uh, and it wasn't an Indian art class, it was a contemporary issues and in, in, in art class and such a brilliant man and uh, really got deep into his semiotic system and approach and, and strategies for institutional critique. And um, I was also um, studying linguistics at the time as a, as a, you know, a double major and um, I was really into to, you know, social linguistics in particular. And um, so I was meeting with all of these professors who would all point me back to Edgar. And um, so I just took their advice and started working with text in a visual art context and doing performance and things like that, um, harassing the anthropology department, which was um, the primary investigator in the human genome project. And they had just cut a deal with the Kiowa Nation um, uh, over sequencing their DNA and copywriting it. And it was a huge problem, you know, and uh, a huge lawsuit and all sorts of complicated issues arose. Uh, being there, Morris Foster was the anthro, the lead anthro on that, um, administering that. So it was an interesting time to be at OU. It was an interesting time to, to get into 
you know, propaganda and, and language and, and see how it occupied people's imagination, see what kind of dialogues it leads to conversations. And like in art, you know, when you're starting out, you want to you want to work from a place of strength until you can think through your art, you know. And that was the thing is I knew how to think through my writing. I didn't know how to think through my visual art. So I used my writing to help think through the art stuff and so the first piece I had in a museum show was um it was a uh single channel video projected across um a prosthetic leg from the early 80s and I'd taken it to an auto body shop and had it pimped out and um and then projected over it and for me, the work was about as simple as just negotiating permission, you know, getting an, a famous, you know, auto body shop painter who's famous for hot rods to turn around and paint this thing. And just being able to pay him 500 bucks to paint that meant everything in the world to me, you know, just to negotiate that because it didn't make any sense to anyone. It didn't make any sense to the shop or anyone. And also like, buying a prosthetic leg is an expensive endeavor too. And especially like an, an older one um, and then the feet for it and stuff like that. It's the whole experience brought me into the discussion of material and the culture that material transports and communicates and um, the conceptual DNA that's in that material. Um, that was my awakening to sculptural practice and what could really be done, you know, how you can extend conversations beyond language. You could deal with a sculptural object, you could deal with, you know, material, you could deal with a process and still be working from a place of strength because I was using sound and text, you know. So it was the things that I knew, like come hell or high water, that I, I felt strong at, and then I would just take leaps with and it's kind of how um, post commodities been but with smarter people more talented people than myself um, involved like we're all working from a place of strength but working over our heads we're trying to do something that you know we've never done before every work that we've done we've never done before we've never done the same type of work twice like we're not redoing a record player in a million different ways. You know, we're doing entirely different systems that are unrelated, um, you know, when we're doing our work. And that's not to disparage a record player, but in the art world, you're disciplined to work with a particular medium or practice or system of logic and brand it and connect it with an audience, connect it with power, build power around it, and then you retire. And you know, since we're not really driven by galleries or by money, we all have, into, we've always had our own jobs. We've never, none of us who have ever been in post-commodity worked primarily as an artist. We all had our own gigs. And that kept us out of the gallery scene. It kept us from relying on loans for production um, from galleries. So we could make whatever we want. And the one thing that we did that we focused on eventually is committing to doing something to where we'd only make work that we couldn't do individually. And we would only work at a budget scale that we wouldn't be able to acquire individually. So we built in this sort of larger scale process and, and more complicated process and total risk-taking because we do not have a studio. We force the institution that commissions the work to rent our studio. You know, we've negotiated every ounce of our work. We haven't paid to produce any of the artwork I showed you or any work we've made since 2007. It's all been commissioned. It's all been commissioned by institutions who wanna exhibit us. And um, we've held them accountable for, for everything, the production, uh, renting the studio, for the materials, for assistance, you know, for architects, for whatever we need that we can't do ourselves, you know, 
we hold that uh, institution accountable because if they really want to show your work, they're going to find the money to do it. And they're not going to haggle over 20 grand. You know, they're not, it just doesn't happen. So that's been our thing is show up, negotiate to do something, to commit the institution to let us do something we've never done before. And we're not sure we can do it. <laughs> that's been like the thing, you know, over and over and over again. We've got a question from Chris Lanier, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Hey there, and, and thanks uh, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, this is sort of jumping off, the, I think you've kind of alluded to this, like in terms of uh, resources that institutions can kind of give to you, but, but I, I would be curious to hear you talk a little more about the tension between working with uh, institutions, right, and in, in a form of institutional critique. So there's already sort of some tension embedded in there and the value of working outside of institutions. Yeah, okay, great. I'll take the value of working outside of institutions first. I think everyone should have a big project that's outside of an institution that takes multiple years so they can build their own art community around the project, their own resources, their own pedagogy, their own system. And that will feed your art practice and grow your art practice and raise awareness around your work in ways that you'd never imagine possible. You know, so I think everybody should take on a project that they are certain they're not going to be able to do and just work at it and, and do it over time because you'll figure it out. We're all artists. We're like autodidacts. We figure shit out that we shouldn't figure out. You know, we're like that smart dog that digs holes, you know as soon as they give us a task we're on it and we can figure it out and then we get bored and i think that's what's great about us is if we take on the unknown or the thing that you don't think you can do you're gonna do it it's gonna work out and it's gonna be pretty badass you know so i think that's so important and we're doing a project right now a second one that's uh independent of institutions for now and it's a it's an instrument um, it's called uh, Cosmo Vision, and it's an instrument that you play. Um, four people have to play it at once, and it's a consensus building music instrument played as a video game. And um, all of the content is um, derived from a cognitive mapping process from the players. So they're playing their worldviews and harmonizing their worldviews with each other to build consensus around um, whatever uh dilemma that they the the people identify and agree on so it's a proposition based type type of sonic um game um consensus building process and worldview manipulation uh type of therapy um the uh in terms of in institutions i i really think to do institutional critique you really have to have a relationship with the institution or i I would be skeptical of the complexity and depth and integrity of the critique because the best institutional critique from my vantage point happens when the institution is a willing partner. And then it becomes a pedagogical process, you know, rather than a dilemma. It's a pedagogical process where um, you can create a pedagogical feedback where you're teaching them their instituting it you they're teaching you you're instituting it you know and and then you break it and rebuild it and reshare it with each other and you're breaking it through a, a process of consensus you know on so many levels like where we cut the hole in the floor we had to go to the governor's office at arizona to get that done um, because the head of facilities at ASU um, uh, was also the head of facilities for all of the government properties in the state of Arizona. So um, like we had to get the board of the museum um, on, you know, to support it. We had to get the president of the university uh, to support it. Um, and then we had to get the governor to support it ultimately. And just to, just to, I want to cuss, but just to cut a damn hole in the floor so people could look at the earth. 
Like, so, so we couldn't have done it without the relationships. And I'll tell you, um, at least from an Indian perspective, you know, relationships define your worldview. It defines everything. And we're really useless without being in, when we're not in relation, we have, we have nothing. And those institutional critiques only have accountability and teeth when you have a relationship, you know? And I think that's something that we're really proud of, you know, that we're not critiquing from the sidelines. We're going into the institution and, you know, working with their organizational and administrative structure and building consensus and becoming a virus. We try to be a indigenous virus. And, and I talk to students about this, like it starts really easy. Like you extend the first phone conversation you have with them, um, five minutes, you know, you're taking time from them. They're taking time from you. Um, it's maybe a little awkward you next phone conversation, extend it like seven or 10 minutes. And the budget that they give you that they propose for your show, you counter it with like three times as much, you know, and the time that they're allocating for your presence, you know, in doing your commissioned work, add a year to it. You know, like you wanna be the virus that's hanging out at that museum that everybody, Nobody knows why you're there, but everyone somehow knows you now. And, um, and then you make your work, you're making work a whole time. And I think that's, it's become more intense for us, the involvement. It's gotten to a point to where our social practice is really with a board and it's with the uh, staff of the institution that we're infiltrating uh, as a virus, you know, like re, structuring the protein, um, you know, DNA um, and building ourselves into it and hopefully getting into their collection and completing the infestation, you know, that type of stuff. It's old, old school Indian stuff, you know. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. We're close on time, but I always like to do kind of a final call for any questions that someone's been holding in their heart that they want to ask before we go. Julia Schwadron. Oh God, I'm not gonna be able to oh, answer this. Oh, this is an easy one. This is an easy one. Softball. Um, I was just curious, actually, I never put this together, but um, were you at all uh, around for this Insight project? It's called. It was called Insight ninety seven, and then there was like it, and in, there was a big uh, federally funded art public art project between artists in the Americas, Mexican artists, and artists in Southern California working on projects across the border. Did you see any of that? I I did. I I was not working as a visual artist at that time, but yeah. I did, I do for sure remember that. Yeah, well, I rem I'm thinking about it because I was an undergrad at UCSD at that time and I got to work as an artist assistant for a bunch of different artists on both sides of the border, but several of them were like big time um, low rider tricksters. So they were like, there was this one piece that was like these guys, um, this, an artist collaborated with a low rider like mechanic and they created a border patrol vehicle that like had this crazy hydraulic system that was like dancing. Did you ever see that? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's there was it just speaking of like institutional critique from the inside, it just seemed that that project was um, if anyone's interested in it, um, you can look it up. But in there was a it's like 40 artists and they all were were given money to do these projects that that directly critiqued the border relationship between Mexicans and American artists and the border as such. Um, there were some really wild projects that I, I wasn't sure if you you may have had anything to do with or knew those guys at that time, but. You know, um, I, I've been a fan of Ruben Ortiz for a long time, you know, and um, just like, I think, uh, 
Yeah, that was his. That was his project with Chava, the guy that was is like this crazy hydraulics guy. Yeah, I think he's really instrumental in so many of our lives. Uh, uh, artists, period. You know, yeah. he's one of those giants. It's like, yeah. oh my god, you know. Right. Right. So, yeah, definitely a a leader and a brilliant, brilliant gene. You know, just creative force. Yeah, that's cool. Awesome. Kara, do you want to close us out with the last question? Yeah, if I can. Thanks. Um, hey, Cade. Um, so <laughs> thanks for your talk. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a, a question about something you've brought up uh, a couple times about um, the work you did before you were an artist. So I work at the intersection of economic development and art, um, and it's a pretty complex space. And there's a lot of negotiations, especially thinking about how to do that equitably and thoughtfully. And um, I guess I just wanted to know if that work that, you know, your previous career seeps into or informs your approach to your um, current and contemporary practice. Oh, yeah, um, it really does, uh, just as much as writing does. And um, thank you for that question, because it's it's really important, not just to me, but also post commodity. Um, for instance, the first piece that Post Commodity proposed among ourselves was the repellent fence. You know, we worked on it for eight years and um, that was a very large and complicated public affairs, you know, battle um, where we really had to map power um, and administrative decision-making processes um, across the border and also look at social policies um, of transborder communities and try to find, you know, something that was like the Goldilocks zone, you know, something that, um, something where their social policies were describing something bigger than just like transborder public safety, you know, like, so a lot of these transborder organizations have like MOUs and, and these MOUs are, are really about public safety. And um, what was different is Agua Prieta and Douglas had an, an MOU that was aspirational. It was about, a outlined their social goals as in terms of education, in terms of um, healthcare, in terms of housing, in terms of economic growth, sector economic development, like the whole nine yards. And, um, and ultimately it was about creating an experiential relationship that predated the war on drugs is what they're trying to achieve. You know, that's when the first border patrol started finding big shipments of pot and stuff about 1974. And that really started changing the landscape down there. Like I wouldn't be, have been able to navigate that without the policy background and training, like how to work from a proposition um, that's policy driven, that is embedded within the fabric of the social policy goals of a community. So that you are using their infrastructure, their aspirations, their determined goals and building um, a potential action to embody that, you know, um, that is what policy does, you know, that's what a, that's what a program at a federal agency, it's embodying, you know, the administration of a law that people write in Congress, you know, and, and so that the artwork became a mechanism to embody that social political will of Agua Prieta and Douglas. So just being attuned to that, knowing how to read it and how to engage it, how to follow it, but how to get ahead of narratives, how to cut off narratives, how to you know, access a public record and just review, well, what has the city council been working on the last five years? You know, um, it's just simple stuff like that. You know, looking at rulemaking proceedings along the border, you know, that affect the, that affect the, the land, the air, water, and, you know, uh, the economy and, and education, you know, all these things. 
Um, the great thing about public policy is it's designed to be transparent for a reason, but it's only transparent to people who know how to navigate it and, um, and engage it. And not, you know, that's where it gets esoteric, um, but it's something that all of us can do if we just slow down and, and you know, make the effort. And I remember in school, we used to have to do this. Um, and this was like before the internet was public, right? We had to do this in 1990. Well, the internet was public. It was after 94. So the web, it was public. Like the, the web existed in 94 for the first time. But there really wasn't a web like how we knew it. Governments were just getting online and stuff. But we had, as an exercise, we had to trace money. Um, we had to trace public dollars for anything. It was random. We pick in a hat. And it could be like um, medical research uh, for cancer. Okay, we have to find that money in through the legislative route, through the, the public hearing route. Um, you know, we had to identify all of the stakeholders and break down the power matrix of this money and how it came to be here to serve our interests. And, that kind of training is what you do on a daily basis as, as an economic development person or as a public policy person. And if you look at our work, you'll find a lot of um, rigor, a lot of conceptual rigor, and you'll find a lot of process rigor, like our ability to get permission to do shit is, um, I think, really exceptional for American Indians with no money. You know, I live in a van, I don't have money. You know, um, Cristo Ball lives in a one bedroom apartment in Mesa, Arizona. You know, like we're not rich, but we can get shit done in some crazy ways. And, and that's the policy, that's the, the training. And, and Cristo Ball too is a PhD in social linguistics. And that's why we jive so much together. Um, and it's the same thing, it's such a powerful skill set, you know. To, for artists to, to build, I think. You know, these all, you know, these skill sets that are non artists that are professional, that are high level, I think it can be so important. Thanks. Fantastic. I think we're gonna wrap it there. So just a big thank you to Cade, thank you so, so much for sharing your art and your time with us these past two weeks and all of you for being with us here. Thank you for um, coming to our final public programming of the winter 2021 MFA in interdisciplinary arts. You can um, keep an eye out because the SNU Fine Arts Department, which works very closely with the MFA, will be continuing virtual programming for the gallery through this spring semester. So you can catch some more awesome artist talks and programming there. So keep an eye out for all of that. Julia, handing it off to you. Um, real quick, sorry, program biz. Uh, before tomorrow morning, just a reminder, 